And what's up? Welcome in. It is GC Live Friday, opening day of baseball season edition of the show. I'm Wes Mitchell. He is Chris Clark, joined very shortly by our partner in crime on GamecockCentral.com, Colin Taylor, uh, Gamecock baseball, basketball, and football beat writer. Going to preview this opening weekend series for you. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about our good friend Clint Hammond. He is the prime sponsor, the presenting sponsor of GC Live every single day that we have the show. I appreciate Clint. Check out Clint's work at ClintHammond.com, 803-771-6933. If you're in the market for a home, if you need to refinance, maybe save a little bit of money on that mortgage, uh, never a better time than now to buy a house, get you a low, low interest rate. And Clint, not only a big Gamecock fan, but also a huge supporter of GamecockCentral.com and obviously of GC Live. So, Chris, we are very thankful for Clint and everything he does for the show. Um Hopefully, uh, soon, Chris is going to have a background um, since I promised that for next week. Maybe overpromised, but uh, what's going on, Chris? Yeah, man, you probably did overpromise. You put words in my mouth, but uh, all good. At some point, we'll have a background. We still are working through that. We got to figure that out. Try to get a little bit better here on the show. But uh, glad to be here. Excited about opening day. I've been uh, I've been sort of pining for some baseball, so we're we're about to get that with. MLB training, college baseball, ready to go. And I see Colin Taylor, who's ready to go, has a better background than I do. I was about to say, we're going to bring in Colin now here in a second, and uh, we'll see if Colin I, – I think it appears Colin maybe already is working on a better background than you there, Chris. But, a, is that uh, a Dolly or a Picasso? Or I'm not um, sure. Well, let, let's find out. But uh, we'll, right, we'll, bring Colin in. we'll start with the background here. Um, <laughs> as you can see, I'm at my parents' house uh this morning so they have better artwork than i do in my background but i still say that my home office at my house at my apartment is better than whatever chris is limping in the barn with this blank well, yeah. well chris is, is a blank wall so yeah you i mean could, um you could have like a, a five-year-old cousin of yours or something draw <laughs> on the wall and it would still be a better background than than yeah. what chris has so um, but no, we're excited for baseball. I'm, I'm looking out right now. I, I mean, I'm assuming maybe we're going to get to play some baseball. I don't know. It's rained for 21 straight days, I, I think, in Columbia, South Carolina. So I don't know. I know softball has been trying to start things off for, for a week now, have, have struggled to do that. Um, Colin, I, I guess, you know, I've, I've been looking at, at tweets from Gamecock baseball from the official accounts and stuff. It seems like they're going to try to play some ball. Um, have you have you checked the weather for this weekend? Yeah, it's supposed to be. We're I'm actually looking at a little bit of sun out the front door window here uh, in Irmo. So we got some sun, um, and it's rain's supposed to clear up. I think about one o'clock today, uh, and they'll be able to play. And it's supposed to be sunny tomorrow, cold and sunny. But that is baseball weather when you start in mid February. <laughs> yeah, go go ahead, Chris. Sorry, Wes. So. Uh, Colin, he, I've been reading a lot of your uh, your, your preview stuff on, on Gamecock Central. Wes and I are so, so inundated with football and recruiting and stuff all the time. I really have to lean on you, which is why you're here, to provide us with your extensive knowledge of Gamecock baseball. So there's so, obviously a lot of storylines with this team as they start the season, but the one I wanted you to dive into was the one that will probably capture the most attention that's hitting, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the – the limited sample size last season before before everything got shut down is there were some encouraging signs as it went along. But obviously the year before, as you've written about lately, not so much. So it seems like there's more optimism about the hitting potential of this team. Break that down for us. Yeah, I mean, pitching is going to be the strong suit of this team. Uh, but there is a belief in the program that – it's an offense that's going to be very similar to what they had in 2018 when they went to a super and finished nine innings away from the college world series. Uh, yeah. You return Brady Allen, who's going to lead off for him and hit 327 last year. Uh, Wes Clark, who hit eight home runs in 16 games, a bunch of really good freshman players of Brennan Malone, who turned down a lot of money to come to school last year, never really got to show what he could do because of a hip injury that limited him the first couple weekends before things shut down. Uh, so they feel really good about these pieces. And then you mix in a uh, Andrew Eister who's hit for a lot of power um, 
a Braylon Wimmer who they've been very, very high on this preseason and Noah Myers. And then you have a Jeff Heinrich, a Colin Burgess. And so there's a lot of pieces that you can fit together and they feel really good about probably nine, 10, 11, even 12 guys that they could plug in and have success at the SEC level. So they have a feeling that this is an offense that's not going to be, for lack of a better pun, pun excluded, hit or miss. They don't think it's going to be hit or miss. Um, they feel like if they can consistently hit for contact, they can get on base and then they can still, and while not sacrificing that power that that Mark Kingston and that staff really enjoys to have as, as part of their lineup. Colin, let, let's talk about the first base position a, a little bit. I, um, you know, I personally would, you know, being someone that's more following it from the outside looking in, I sort of assume this offseason, um, you know, maybe, maybe that was going to be a guy like Wes Clark's um, spot. Maybe that was going to be his role. It, it seems like from everything I've read, um, his role is going to be more along the lines of the DH a lot of, a lot of days and then, you know, maybe backup catcher, I, I guess. So, and you've had some other guys competing at, at first base. Um, who Who's the sort of uh, opening day starter there projected wise at, at first base? And um, maybe tell everybody a little bit about him because that, that was a situation just sort of coming at it from the outside looking in that played out a little bit differently than I suspected it would. Yeah. Uh, at the end of fall ball, if you had told me that Wes Clark wasn't going to be the starting first baseman, I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, just because he's hit for power, but you had your freshman catcher who was expected to be the backup, Alec Boychuk, go down for the year with a foot injury. He's had surgery on his, his foot and um, kind of forced Wes Clark into that backup catcher role. And so he's going to move there. That's going to be his position. And when he's not catching, he's going to DH. And when Colin Burgess is out for a game, or they're going to platoon that spot because you can't have a guy catch 56 games in a regular season. So um, when he's Colin Burgess isn't catching, West Clark will. And then that first base spot, David Mendham, is your starter. He's a left-handed bat, has been, I mean, absolutely insanely good in the preseason, hitting for power, getting on base. And he's going to be your starter at first base until – He's not. I mean, it's just one of those things that he's going to go out there, have to lose it at first base and uh, has played really well defensively, really improved from the fall to the spring. And I, I've really liked what I've seen in, in the limited sample size that these last three weeks have given us. But yeah, he's your starter. And then you could have a, a Braylon Wimmer if they really want to. Um, a Joe Satterfield, Josiah Seidler and Wes Clark play there as well if needed. But David Mendham is has been by far and away the best first baseman they've had in the preseason. Jump to the other side, Colin, um, you know, in terms of pitching, uh, Daniel Watts in the chat here also asking about pitching depth for us for the Gamecocks this year. Um, I, I wanted to hit on the starters there. Obviously, rotation set, um, Farr, Jordan, Bosnick. You know, tell us about expectations for those guys, you know, why that's the rotation, why Kingston's going with those guys as the starting opening weekend rotation. Yeah, I mean, it's those are the three best pitchers on staff right now. Um I mean, Skylar Mead told me this week that the two best recruits that they had in this 2021 class were Thomas Farr and Brandon Jordan, who decided to come back. Both had chances to get money after that shortened 2020 season. Um, they had chances to go pro and both opted to come back and essentially bet on themselves. So those are the two guys, the two frontline guys that you knew were going to be in the rotation. And Julian Bosnick, another year removed from Tommy John, uh, has been lights out, has gotten up to 94, 95 on his fastball, sits in the low 90s with a really good breaking ball, a really good competitive edge, and gives South Carolina a lefty presence in a rotation that hasn't really been there. I'm not comparing him to Jordan Montgomery, but he's a guy that they, you know, he was let the last real lefty that saw consistent time in the rotation. So, um, yeah, those guys are have been by far and away the best. Um, I was – there was talk of them doing a right, left, right and starting Jordan on Sunday and Bosnick on Saturday, but they just went with the approach of let's throw our best two arms out there on Friday, Saturday, and then get to Sunday with it, the lefty. Um, it could change, but those are the two guys that – or three guys that are the best three pitchers right now, and then they have obviously maybe the most depth they've had from a pitching standpoint since Kingston and me have been here. Uh 
Kyle, let's go into a little more detail on those guys just from like a maybe a repertoire standpoint. I I I don't know if I'm alone in this, but I, I feel like there were so many new guys on the team last year. And then, you know, the, the, the season gets going and then it, it's quickly interrupted. You never really get to see these guys against SEC competition. Um, I feel like we – um, and I'll just say in general, like everybody, Gamecock Nation, you know, fans, media, et cetera, unless you're out there like you were, you know, maybe watching some scrimmages or really diving in, I don't know if we know these guys yet. Like I don't know if we all have like a feel for for what these guys are all about. Um, I, I mean, I've seen the quotes. Uh, you know, I saw a quote saying, I think it said Thomas Farr, um, you know, is potentially as good as any Friday guy in, in the country. Um, tell us about – you know, Thomas Farr, tell us about a Brandon Jordan. What are they going to both be about as far as their pitching style, how they get guys out, and um, in a perfect world for South Carolina, j- just how good could that duo potentially be? I mean, it's – Vanderbilt and Florida are two completely different animals in terms of pitching, but when you look at a, a Farr and a Jordan, just based on upside alone and talent, it might be – the third or fourth best one-two punch in the league this year from a Friday, Saturday standpoint. And, um, far is a little bit more velocity. Um, his fa- average fastball is above 95, is topped out 97, 98. will sit 94, 96 with a change up in the mid 80s, a breaking ball in the low to mid 80s with some really good spin rate, some really good tilt, uh, which kind of helps it move through the zone and get out of the zone quick. So, yeah, he's really good. Jordan's a guy that's going to not be as necessarily powerful in terms of velocity, but tops out 94, sits 91 to 93 with a cutter. Um, his fastball's got some sink to it, throws a changeup, throws a slider-ish pitch. Um, and he's just – he's a guy that's going to – he can strike people out. He struck out a lot last year, but as someone who can also – get ground balls and force double plays and, and same with Mar. He's more of a strikeout guy, but both can get quick outs when they need to, um, especially if it's a double play situation. And with a guy like Bosnick, um, not necessarily since he's a lefty, not necessarily the flamethrower that the other two are, but we'll sit 91 to 92 um, with a really good breaking ball and a good changeup as well. That gets outs. Uh, he's not necessarily the same kind of strikeout guy as the other two, but really efficient and has been, I mean, maybe the best, not newcomer, but a guy that's taken the biggest jump from the end of last season to where they, they're sitting at right now. Kyle, and you hit on, hit on something there, you know, defensively in terms of forcing ground balls, double plays. What's the defensive potential of this team, whether it's sort of their ceiling or, or just where you sort of expect them to settle? Is this a team that, you know, is below average, solid, above average? Is this a team that can – save some runs with, with great plays, you know, where do you see them fitting in from a defensive standpoint, just based on what we know right now? I mean, the potential's there. Uh, I don't think it's going to be, you know, this elite never makes an error kind of defense, but there are guys that are really solid. Like you said, um, George Khalil, and Michael Robinson are the two battling for the shortstop job and both are elite defenders. Um, it's a very solid outfield defend, you know, defensively. The first base position's gotten a lot better from a defensive standpoint. Uh, Mendham's making a, a big jump there from fall to now spring. And uh, Brennan Malone's a, a really good third baseman defensively. Uh, needs to continue to get better, but has shown a lot of promise there. So they're not a finished product yet. It's still a work in progress, but this has the potential to be a, a good SEC defense and, and be able to save some runs at, at times. Um, and there's some really – Mixed in with that, some elite defenders as well. Gamecocks, again, uh, starting this season today with Dayton. Of course, three-game series, as always. Um, 4 p.m. first pitch today, 1 p.m. first pitch on Saturday, noon first pitch on Sunday. You can watch um, all those, actually. You can stream them on SEC Network Plus. Uh, just pull them up on on uh, whatever app you use on your TV, whatever device you use on your TV. Uh, I know that's always a common question. Where, How do I watch the game? What channel is the game on? Um, it's not an actual channel, but you can watch it on your TV. Use your Fire Stick, your Roku, any of those devices. You can watch the game. Um, Colin, uh, and by the way, if everybody wants to read a little bit about the series, a little more in depth, uh, read Colin's piece, Everything You Need to Know, Dayton Series. It's on GamecockCentral.com. I believe it's actually a free story. 
But give us a little uh, quick preview specifically of this series, uh, Colin. Um, what do you know about Dayton? Are they a team? I, I know in baseball sometimes, uh, you know, we, we've seen South Carolina start the year, you know, win a couple, lose one, maybe to a team fans don't want them to lose two. Is this, is this a team that can come in here and steal a game from South Carolina? Um, we all know if you don't play well, anybody can steal yeah. one. From you. But from an expectation standpoint, is this a team that, that South Carolina should handle this weekend or, or are they kind of one of those sneaky good teams? I mean, the expectation internally is to always sweep. Uh, this is a team that went six and eight last year. Um, they feel just from a talent standpoint, South Carolina's better just because it's an SEC team in the top 25. Um, they have a good Friday guy, a lefty that South Carolina is going to have to face tonight. Then another lefty on Saturday who doesn't have necessarily the same numbers. Um, their Dayton's third baseman is considered a draft prospect. Uh, didn't hit for average last year, but can hit for some power. He's their third baseman, um, very complicated last name. But they – it's it's a team that's not – it maybe isn't expected to be that great. I think they're picked third in the Atlantic 10 this year going into it, but um, have a good first round – I mean, not a good f- first guy in the rotation that South Carolina is going to have to deal with. And um, sometimes those lefties give South Carolina problems, and they're facing two of them this weekend. And the good news is that South Carolina has a lot of right-handed hitters in that lineup. So it shouldn't be an issue versus, you know, in terms of the ability to run out some, some righty offensive guys that can get to a lefty. Obviously first order of business, Colin, it is Dayton this weekend and trying to take care of those guys, but get to a point where it's SEC play. It's more of a national so big picture question for you since it is opening day, since first pitch hadn't been thrown. How does this team stack up based on, again, what we know now, how do they stack up in the conference? Earlier you were talking about Florida, Vanderbilt being, you know, different level in terms of pitching. Where do we see South Carolina right now in terms of maybe an SEC pecking order, which is probably going to reflect a national pecking order to yeah. some degree? We don't know. I mean, right now, Florida and Vanderbilt, I feel like, are the two teams that are obviously just, I mean, a, a cut above nearly everybody else. But then there's a group of – four or five teams, the Mississippi States. Ole Miss is kind of in that Florida Vanderbilt tier this year just because, I mean, they got a lot of preseason hype. But there's a group of about four or five schools. Um, after that, the South Carolinas, the Texas a and the Mississippi States, the LSUs, the Arkansas of the world that are tournament caliber teams that will jockey for position outside of that. It's just it's a very deep SEC this year. South Carolina, I think, can finish anywhere between, you know, obviously if they beat the right teams, can finish one, two, whatever in, in the East, but um, we'll have to contend against some really good opponents and could finish anywhere from third to fourth to fifth in the East and still have a good year because the SEC is so deep. And um, they're definitely, I would say, in that second tier right now. And that's not a bad thing um, just because. It's not because the second tier is bad. It's because the first tier of the Florida and Vanderbilt <laughs> world, and we're all just living in it right now. But South Carolina is a very, very good team that has a chance to not only make the tournament, but make a run in it. Colin, I, I know you got a lot of stuff to get ready. You got a board of trustees meeting. South Carolina, I guess, officially will um, lock in um, Ontario Hardesty um, w- with the meeting today. But uh, we'll let you get out of here, man. But, uh, Maybe give us final thought. What, what's one thing you're going to be looking for this weekend? Yeah, I'm looking at the offense. Um, I'm not really worried about South Carolina's pitching right now. It's a deep and talented and just hard-throwing pitching staff that is going to be good. I'm The offense is something that I'm interested to see how it looks, what the approach looks like, two-strike hitting, two-out hitting, um, if they're able to hit for power, draw walks, and just look like a complete and well-rounded offense that we saw signs of last year and saw signs of growth with, but I want to see if they can do that from the jump this season. Um, so the offense is something I'm actually, I'm, I'm going to be really intent on looking at and seeing just how good those returners can be mixed with some of the newcomers into that lineup. Colin, great stuff as always, man. We appreciate the time. Um, of course, everybody can check out his work on GameCockCentral.com. Um, a lot of our baseball content is free, so you can read some of that stuff for free. Obviously, a lot of the analysis and, and in-depth stuff is uh, behind the paywall. So come check us out, GameCockCentral.com, or follow Colin on Twitter at Colin P. Taylor. Is a P still there or is it just Colin Taylor? 
We dropped the P. Colin Taylor. Yeah, we dropped, we dropped the P. All yeah. right, Colin Taylor at Colin Taylor on Twitter. Colin, we appreciate it, man. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. With Chris, step that background game up. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, guys. <laughs> I will, man. I will. See you later. See you. Appreciate it, Colin. Uh, that's Colin Taylor, GamecockCentral.com, beat writer. Um, going to be joined shortly. Pre-recorded interview with uh, Carlin Splatel, new Gamecocks DB um, signee. Uh, Chris, should, should we go ahead and just go on out to that, man? Yeah, let's go on out to that. Maybe we wrap all wrap this whole shebang up, you know, at the end of the show. Sounds good. All right, it sounds good to me. Going out now to uh, – this is, of course, new South Carolina DB commit and signee. South Carolina has announced him as a um, official part of the program um, actually since this interview was done. But let's go out now. Carlos Patel, new Gamecocks commitment. We're joined by a very special guest here on GC Live, brand-new South Carolina commitment. He is there at Assumption College. It's going to be a graduate transfer to the Gamecocks. Six foot two, 190-pound defensive back, Carlin Splatel, again, announced his decision on Wednesday to join the South Carolina football program, chose the Gamecocks over offers from Mississippi State, Coastal Carolina, and some other schools as well. Carlin's uh, welcome into GC Live, man. Congrats on the commitment. Obviously, a big day for you on Wednesday. I'll give you the easiest question of the day so far. Tell us, what was it about South Carolina? Why did you choose the Gamecocks? What made it the correct fit for you for this final season of eligibility that you have coming up? I just love the place. Um, when I had the virtual visit, I could see how the coaching staff is. And, you know, they um, they were great together. Um, and especially with the with the defensive back coach, Coach Gray and Coach White, uh, they know how to develop people. And they have a great defensive scheme that I think that I could come in and um, and and do good in. I got you, man. So, um Obviously, uh, fa- fairly quick process for you there, maybe, but maybe maybe take us through it, go back to sort of that decision to enter the transfer portal. Um, kind of take us through, I, I know at one point, um, it seemed like Coastal Carolina hopped in on you, maybe before a couple of the other schools and were, you know, really hard after you. Um, Addison Williams, the DB's coach there, is actually a South Carolina grad, so interesting connection there. But um, maybe take us through that initial decision to enter the portal and just sort of how the process went as you marched towards ultimately committing to the Gamecocks. Yeah, so I entered the portal in um, in October. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I was planning to finish my career at Assumption. You know, I wanted to, um, but with them canceling the season, and they they actually we was planning to play in the spring, mm-hmm. and then once they finally canceled that, um, I decided to enter the portal to. I know I could play at a higher level. And I wanted to see what my options can be. And with the great coaching staff that I have at Assumption, um, they let me enter the portal and they were still with me. Um, they still honored my scholarship and had a sponsor team for me. So um, I'm thankful for them for that. And um, I entered the portal, you know, I was I was expecting like low FBS or um, high FCS, somewhere around there. Um, so I entered the portal. I got a couple FCS offers. And um, they started kind of building up. And then uh, that's when Coastal, Coastal Carolina was my first FBS offer. Mm -hmm. They offered me and then um, South Alabama offered me. And then that's when Mississippi State, they offered me. And um, Old Dominion ended up offering me and South Carolina. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's been a long process since October. Um, I'm just glad I found my home. Um, When I was entering, all I was hearing was the risk of entering from a smaller school. There's so many people in the portal and not a lot find a home. Um, I'm just thankful and blessed that I did. And uh, and yeah, I'm just glad to be a Gamecock. Can't wait to get to work. You know, speaking of finding your home there, so very unique situation with anybody who's being recruited right now, as you know, um, no in-person, you know, recruiting trips. Everybody's talking about these virtual visits that that you have to take. Obviously, I think you took yours to South Carolina like the day before you ended up announcing your commitment. Um, give us a little insight, Carlins. What exactly is a virtual visit as far as, I mean, are, are you hopping on Zoom? Are they showing you videos? Are they walking around uh, the facility with the, ca- you know, holding up the camera? How exactly does a virtual visit work? And I guess it's probably not the most ideal way to pick a school, but it's kind of what we have to deal with right now. Yeah, so, you know, everything's on Zoom. You know, they got they have everything planned out of um of what time they're gonna show me this, what time they're gonna show me that, you know, it's all on a schedule. 
And um, and yeah, they, they had the videos playing. They had different people entering um, the Zoom to talk about certain things. Um, thankfully for me, I'm only doing it. I'm only transferring for one year. Mm -hmm. So like um, the campus, stuff like that, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm not I'm not a high school kid that's they're gonna be there for four years. So um I just seen that football facilities, they had they had great facilities. And uh, and yeah, it was just it was just a great it was a great visit. You're um you know, a guy that's uh grew up up north, uh, played up north. Have, have you ever have you been to the state of South Carolina before or will that be the first time you've been here when you come down for uh to officially move in? <laughs> it's gonna be my first time. Okay. I got you. Is that uh, is, is that weird at all, man? Is that weird? Is it scary? Is it exciting? How how does that feel? <laughs> no, it's exciting. Um, it's just a just another start to a journey. Um, mm -hmm. it's just exciting. You you mentioned Torian Gray, the DBs coach, when uh, you know, when we first talked about why you chose South Carolina. What was it about him as you sort of started to get to know him? You know, and and kind of his message to you. What what was it about him that kind of drew you to him? Um, just ever since we started talking, um, he always kept it real with me. Um, he always, he never, uh, beat around the bush. He just kept it straightforward. And, um, and just his track record of, of who he coached and, um, and he knows how to develop people. And my, my goal is to end up going to the NFL. So mm -hmm. I think him, um, I think he, he is one of the best people that I can surround myself with to uh develop me to pursue that goal we uh sort of along the same lines we, we've talked a lot here about um, the need at defensive back considering you know losing a jc horn losing an izzy mcquamu they've had a couple of guys transfer out at that position as well with coach beamer and coach gray and the you know clayton white what what was their message directly to you sort of about Hey, here's the situation. Here's what here's what it's gonna have to take. Here's what you're gonna have to do, you know, to come in and, and be ready to to play. What was the message to you about the opportunity there at that spot? Um, they were just telling me um they're they're short on DBs. Um, they need people, they need experienced guys to come in, mm -hmm. um, both at corner or nickel. And um, and they just kept telling me that there's opportunity there. Um, and yeah, I think I think it's gonna be, I think. Them, it was was the best opportunity for me to go to, and um, and yeah, this it was just the best situation. Talk us through this just a little bit. I mean, obviously, you're a guy here uh, with some size. Uh, you like to hit people. I, I've seen on your film. Um, give us just a little quick, um, you know, synopsis of of your own game. What what are you seeing on film here from yourself? Um, what what do you sort of believe are, are your strengths as far as your skill set goes? Um, I think it's it's definitely my instincts um, mm -hmm. to be able to play with the quarterback. Um, and actually, my the second clip that that I played, um, it was it was a cover three that where I picked off the screen. Mm -hmm. I just came up, um, just film study um, my instincts. Um, I think I think I'm a I'm a physical corner that will come up and tackle. I can play in the box. I can cover your number one wide receiver. Um, and yeah, I think I'm a I'm an all around DB that can bring a lot of different aspects to um, a defense. You know, we, we were talking about that on the show yesterday, Carlin's in that um, you know there, there's a need at cornerback, but as you mentioned, I, I think there's maybe a need um, at several positions in the secondary. Uh, you know, I think the nickelback is on the field a lot in this scheme. Uh, you know, I think it's a base four two five from what we've been told. So. Um, do you sort of feel like maybe your versatility um, could, could give you a little, maybe a leg up as well? Was it, was that something that was talked about? Hey, you know, maybe it's at corner, maybe it's at nickel. Let's, you know, just find a way to get you on the field potentially. Yeah, definitely. Um, that, that's one thing that I talk to them a lot about and um, they could see me either playing nickel or corner. So um, when I get down there, whatever they have me at, um, just got to compete and uh, do what I know I can do. Um, and yeah, and, and win a spot. I, I got you, man. So uh, you're, you're going to be playing SEC ball. Tell us what um what what, what does that mean to you? To um, I mean, most people sort of just think of SEC ball as like kind of being the the holy grail of, of like college football. Um, how how do you think that transition is going to be? And and what does it mean just to know in um, 
you know, I guess what, like six, seven months, you're going to be running out there suited up uh, as an SEC football player. Yeah, um, you know, the SEC is the best conference in college football. They have great receivers, um, fast, big, you know, um, athletic. Uh, but, you know, some people like to knock down um, Division Two, And I've gone against great receivers, uh, not only in practice, but um, also in the end games. Um, I've gone against some of the best receivers in, in Division Two in that level. And, um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's obviously going to be a step up, but, you know, not, not as much as people think. Do you, do you come in with a little chip on your shoulder about that? Sort of like you, you want to show, uh, you know, I don't know the proper way to say it, but you want to show people, Hey, um, you know, D2 guys, we can play ball too. And we can fit in at this level. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I think a, a lot of people is going to be talking about a D2 guy coming to the SEC and um, there's only so much that people can say or I can say. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather just show what I can do and uh, my actions speak louder. And um, and eventually they, they're going to see. Speaking of actions, final question for you here, Carlins. What is um, what was sort of the next step as far as when do you arrive down here in Columbia? And what are you going to be doing, you know, maybe these next couple of months? What do you have to do to get yourself physically, mentally um, ready to, to get down here? Yeah, so I graduate May 11th, so mm -hmm. I assume I'll get get over there sometime after that. And um, just from now till May, um, just just working as hard as I could. Um, I work out at a great facility here called Exceed, and um, my trainers Sean Smith and Shane Davenport. They're they're two guys that have a track record of of um, of training um, pro athletes, so they know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing, and um, they're helping me gain some weight um, and be able to move with it too. And, um, and yeah, I just got to keep on getting ready. Um, I can't let no kind of hype get to me or, um, you know, the, the, the bad things that people say about a D2 kid. Um, I just got to keep on working as hard as I could. He is Carlin Splatel, brand new Gamecocks commit. He'll, uh, He'll graduate in May, then he'll be down here, and he'll be uh, playing for your Gamecocks. Uh, Carlin's, uh, we appreciate the time today, man. Congrats on the commitment. Um, you, you got any final quick message for the Gamecock fans that are looking forward to watching you play? I can't wait to get down there. Can't wait to be a Gamecock. Awesome, man. There it is. Again, congrats. Uh, big uh, big day for you yesterday. We, we, we appreciate the time, man. So thanks, and uh, we'll see you down here soon, okay? All right. Thank you for having me. Maybe I should unmute myself, man. I'm pulling a, a U over here. That's, uh, of course, Gamecocks commit Carlin Splatel. Um, your thoughts um, watching that or listening to that, anything that that caught your attention, Chris? Well, you mentioned that, you know, during the interview, Wes, the, the chip on the shoulder. You can definitely see that, you know, with, with Carlin Splatel, uh, the chip on his shoulder, not yours, um, <laughs> where – you know, he, he's definitely aware of the fact that, look, I mean, this day and age of social media, I'm sure probably, or not even probably, we saw some of it when, when he committed, um, whether it's here, which is okay, people can have their opinions here or on forums, social media, wherever people are talking about Division Two kids. And I understand what we cover this, man. If, if South Carolina signed um, a class of 25 guys who were Division Two level every year, they would not win many games in the SEC. They probably wouldn't win. They probably win one to zero every year if they did that. Right. But you can find good players at that level. If you find the right one um, pro, you know, when you take sort of the pro approach to it, if NFL teams took, if their 53 man roster was comprised of guys who were division two level at college, they probably would not be very good at the pro level either. But what they do is they'll handpick a couple guys that they feel like can play and, regardless of whether that player is from Alabama, South Carolina, uh, Montana State, wherever it may be, assumption, you know, you have to just make sure it's a, it's a good football player. I actually did some digging, Wes, in the last draft. Three uh, players from the Division Two and three level were taking the NFL draft. And at the, in September of last year, there were 54 guys on, on season opening rosters who were Division Two in the NFL. So, there can be good players, as Carlin said, at that level. Um, the key is, 
you know, how does he fit in at South Carolina? What does he bring to the field? And as we as we broke down pretty extensively on Wednesday show, there are some things to like about Carlin Spatel, and he plays a need position for South Carolina. So how good will he be? How much of an impact will he make? We'll, we'll have to see as time goes on. Yeah, I think that's the big thing, man, that it is, it is a huge need position. I want to go into that a little bit more in detail here in a second. But um, we, we did see the comments yesterday. I will also – and here's the thing. I, I haven't seen everything that's on Twitter um, or what all is out there. I don't think anybody on our show in our chat – maybe there was a, maybe there was one um, from somebody who doesn't usually – just some random person popped up and maybe had some really negative stuff to say. But uh, the stuff that I we, – we have about eight Gregs, I think, that are, that are on the show. The stuff that I, I think Greg was saying, um, you know, just about, uh, you know, that there's a transition to, to from D2 to SEC ball. I don't – you know, I don't think there's anything wrong. With, with saying that, so I, I don't, I don't want any, anybody to misconstrue misconstrue what I'm about to say as that I was calling out those comments. Now, some of the over the top comments from other people, some of the stuff that's probably on Twitter. There was somebody on here that I, I think didn't even put their name on there that was that was talking a little junk. For one, I do think we got to remember, y'all. The, I mean, these kids do see this stuff. People sometimes get on social media, run their mouths without realizing the kids see this stuff. And if y'all are paying very close attention, you would realize that maybe that's a family member that is responding to you in the chat about what you're saying about somebody in their family. So we do have family members watching the show. We have family members in the chat of the show. So I say that just to say you can have, you can have nobody saying people can't have an opinion. And it's okay to say it's going to be a, an adjustment from D2 ball to SEC ball. But it also doesn't mean he's not a good football player. It doesn't mean he can't come in and help this team. And I actually, after we recorded the interview, I, I sort of – I didn't want to put him on the spot, but I, I asked Carlins, I said, you know, so so you, you've seen, you, you've heard stuff about that. He said, oh, yeah, absolutely. So there there is a chip on the shoulder about – you know, and I even – you know, you always critique yourself as well. At least I, you know, I try to critique myself. When I asked him about SEC ball, I was like, man, I went really heavy on the whole, you know, SEC thing. And, and he, you know, he jumped right on it. Hey, D, you know, D2 guys can play as well. So, um, you know, I, I think there is a, there's a chip on the shoulder um, and there's a need at South Carolina. So it, it's okay to say, hey, D2 guy, a D2 guy is going to have a little bit of a transition, but, also, I don't think it's okay to say, oh, there's no way this guy's going to be able to help this team because he's coming from a smaller school. That That's not true. That's not the case. And also, it depends on your expectation as well because what what if the kid – what if he comes in, has a solid year, um, you know, plays some snaps, helps on special teams, helps on defense, you know, isn't drafted but just helps the team – win some games that's still a successful one year career for for a transfer nobody should be putting crazy expectations on him to say you know this guy has to come in and be all sec but there is talent here there's size here there's ability here and if you look at south carolina's secondary chris as we've talked about there's a need at cornerback nickelback and at safety so I and, and that was probably my biggest takeaway was fr- from the interview was the mention because you and I had talked about this on the show. I probably I think it was Wednesday. Um, could he possibly play some nickel? I think he's a, a fit for that position, depending on what South Carolina sort of is looking for in this defensive scheme. I'm not even so sure he, he couldn't maybe help you at, at safety. Now, I, I don't know if you want to put that on a guy. I, I don't know how much safety he's played in his career. He's a one year one year of eligibility. You don't. He's already going to be making a transition, learning the defense. I don't know if you want to put him in another position completely. I'm just saying physically, I, I think he could probably do it. But looking at the film, he does play outside some. He has played in the box some, which would be uh, give him a comfort level at that nickel spot. You're a little bit more. His physicality, I think, transfers well to that spot, and you're a little bit more protected in that you're not outside, you know, on an island. So. I 
I personally wouldn't be surprised at all if this kid ends up playing a role at Nickelback based on his skill set and South Carolina's need. Yeah, good point. And I think, um, you know, there's so many questions in the secondary of, you know, who slots where. We've already sort of gotten the, hey, who do you think the starting five will be? And, and I, we really don't know. I mean, you, you can you can probably slot a couple guys or maybe three guys on this roster and thinking that, hey, th- these make sense. This is more likely than not. But you just don't know for sure with some of the moving parts, some of the guys on the roster that maybe haven't played as much that have some ability or, and are going to have a chance. And then factoring in some of these transfers like Carlin Spatel, David Spalding from Georgia Southern. Now, Platel will be getting on campus a little later, obviously, uh, in the summer. It ha- doesn't have that benefit of, of going through South Carolina spring ball or getting acclimated to the program in, in January and February. He didn't have that. Um, but that said, it, he, he has experience. And like you said, has played multiple spots. The nickel, I think, with, in Clayton White's scheme is going to be really intriguing. I think we mentioned on a previous show that the guy who played nickel for him at Western Kentucky for several years – was a, a little bit of a smaller guy. I think he was 5'9", so he's a little bit smaller. It's more of a true DB position. So I don't know if it's all about, hey, this guy has to fit these certain dimensions, but you do have to have a skill set for nickel, right? And you got to be able to cover guys. You need to have some physicality. You need to be able to play the run. And at nickel, sometimes you can get in trouble in the run game if you cannot hold up physically. And so – Carlin Spatel, if he was slotted in that spot, that's something where you probably have some confidence from a physical standpoint that he can hold up. So um, I'm, I'm on the same page with U.S. and that I think it seems like, given the timing and the skill set, that, that corner nickel makes the most sense. And, and obviously special teams is an area in which South Carolina is going to be auditioning a bunch of people, and he probably has a good shot there as well. Yeah, no doubt, man. Uh, Steve on Facebook says you are giving it way too much time. I don't really know what that means, Steve, uh, but we're here to talk about uh, Gamecock football, and right now that was a big topic of discussion. And obviously, uh, the kid, uh, the kid caught caught those comments. You know, he saw them. Um, it's 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 a different world now than it was 10, 15 years ago. The players are on social media. The fans are on social media. They see what people say. They read what people say. It's easy to say they shouldn't look at it. It's easy to say they shouldn't, you know, let it bother them. But generally, people people say, ah, oh, you shouldn't let that bother you. But then if it was reversed, most people are going to read something. And if it's about them, they're going to feel some type of way about it. So, you know, it's kind of hard to sit there and say that. I know that's that's part of it. You put yourself in the arena and you compete. You put yourself out there. Criticism is is part of the game, but um, let, let's see what the kid can do. Let, let's find out um, how it looks. And the, the need at defensive back is so huge right now that he, he's going to have every opportunity to play because they, they didn't just lose a couple of guys. You know, you're talking about losing numbers at every position. And the more we talk about this stuff, Chris, the more – you know, you're sitting here and you say you got some newcomers probably can help you at corner, help you at nickel. When you were naming the guys at safety, um, you know, the other day, I'm sitting there saying, man, that that is a scary position right now for South Carolina. So so we'll see what the secondary looks like moving forward. But that that's going to be a big question mark, not just all offseason, but headed into the season and, and into um, probably maybe even throughout the season. Muted. How was I even muted? I don't think I even hit the button, but apparently I did. Uh, it's you've sort of got this void of, you know, proven talent and a, a void of depth. You know, where South Carolina has added some more in terms of personnel numbers, but you, you still don't really know what they have with that, and especially guys that have actually played safety. Um, you would think that they're going to have to take a look at moving some guys. You know. Um, a lot of the guys that were brought on the roster previously that are still on the roster were thought of as maybe more corners, right? But, um, you know, they drew some looks at safety, some of them. But is it going to be a – like, does Joey Hunter get a safety look? Is it is it Dominic Hill? Is it, you know, O.D. Fortune we know was a guy that was being eyeballed as a safety under the previous regime. So they're going to have to move some guys there just to give them some more depth. 
you know, and I think that was going to be the case without some of the defections. You know, uh, the defections were were more at corner, you know, and nickel. You, you lost Jamie Robinson, who could play safety, who could play nickel. Uh, but then other than that, you lost Horn, McQuamu, and you lost Johnny Dixon. Horn and Dixon were, of course, corners, and Horn started his career as a nickel. Izzy McQuamu had played some safety, and, and so he could he could certainly slot there. But the point is, regardless of what those guys did, and the expectation was to lose a couple of those guys, you were going to need some more depth at safety. All right, y'all, and unless we have any final questions, I, I think that's about it for the show today. Rhett did ask if we had a 40 time for the kid. I – I feel like I saw on the on his huddle from a while back maybe a four six forty yard dash. I, I don't, you know, forty yard dash is that, that's something, you know, it's it's good for discussion. But also, you sort of you rarely get that information. I, I think with a college kid, it, it seems like, and um, I I don't know. I, obviously, that's something people like to talk about, and it does have its place. Um, that that was one thing that. I said would be a big part of the transition. And again, I say this not not saying he can't do it at all, just that anytime you're making this jump, um, you know, can can you stay with guys on the top end um on long breaking routes and uh routes that finish down the field? That that would be something to watch as you're sort of looking at him and that transition to uh to the SEC level. But Again, and that's that's maybe you know a nickelback spot. You're probably not having to carry guys down the field without help as much as you maybe are on the outside. So, I, so Rhett, it is a good question. I don't have a specific answer for you. I don't know, Chris, if you've seen an updated forty yard dash for the kid anywhere or heard, but um, but yeah, we'll see. Nope, I sure haven't. I hadn't seen an updated one. I, I I'm with you. I saw online. I think you know, somewhere around that four or six range. So, um, and, and also, you know, now that I think of it, um, mentioned that conversation I had with a scout about Carlin Spatel, and, and that was the thought that he was probably in that four or six range. I don't know if that was based on sort of watching film and seeing how he stacked up and sort of guesstimating, or if that was something where he had actually been timed and there was some access to those numbers. But the thought was in that four or six range, probably. I got you. Good stuff. Um, all right, y'all. Uh, enjoyed the show. Enjoyed the week. As always, um, check out some Gamecock baseball this week. That'll be coming up. If you're watching us live right now, it's 1250. So uh, first pitch of the South Carolina baseball season at 4 p.m. live from Founders Park. You can see it on SEC Network Plus. Colin Taylor will be there. He'll have complete coverage, as he always does, from uh, all Gamecocks baseball. Um, looking forward to it. And next week, uh, we'll dive in, may maybe another guest or two. Uh, Chris, you got any final thoughts for the week, man? No final thoughts for the week. Ready to uh, – I was going to say kickoff. That's a really terrible term. Ready to uh, see first pitch of some yeah, see, I, I was going to say, dude, I don't know what the proper – because we. that's one thing I was always taught in school. You don't mix the terminology. Like people a lot of times will say, oh, they're going to kick off the basketball season. No, you're going to tip off basketball season. You kick off a football season, but I don't know what you you don't first pitch off a baseball season. So I, I don't know what the verb is there for for that. I think you so, just say first pitches today. Ready yeah. for first pitch. There you go. Oh, yeah, first pitch for opening day yep. is today for the Gamecocks. We're looking forward to it. Hopefully, we get some beautiful weather this weekend after it raining for three weeks straight. Uh, appreciate y'all. Appreciate the support. Appreciate y'all. Uh, Alex says tee off. No, see, I think of golf if you say tee off. Golf so, or tee off. Yeah. Um, I don't know. All right, y'all. If you, if you have answers, uh, save them for Monday. We appreciate it. Appreciate the support. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. And uh, rate, review, subscribe if you are listening on all the major podcast platforms. Appreciate it as always. Uh, y'all.